Welcome to this presentation on Kraton. Actually, this presentation is a repeat of a, the same presentation that I gave at Midwestern University in July of 2017. This presentation has been recorded in November of 2017, so all of its information actually reflects the current state of knowledge that I have uh, as of November 2017. The title of the presentation that I gave back in uh, July of 2017 is Kratom from Traditional Medicine to Herbal Supplement to Drug of, of Abuse and Back. Um, my association is with the University of Florida, uh, the College of Pharmacy. I am currently their clinical associate professor. And my association with Midwestern University is as an adjunct faculty in the College of Pharmacy, the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences. So um, what I would like to talk about today in this uh, presentation is a little bit of how I got involved with Kratom research and uh, my recent publication about Kratom uh, use pattern in the United States. So let's talk a little bit about what Kratom actually is. Uh, Kratom is a tree and its scientific name is Mitragyna speciosa in the family of Rubiaceae, so it's actually closely related to coffee itself. Uh, coffee is a shrub or a tree itself, uh, and if you look at uh, the actual leaf, uh, it's also very similar to the coffee leaf. Uh, Kratom grows uh, naturally uh, to South uh, East Asia. Uh, it's a subtropical and tropical tree that uh, grows in Malaysia and Thailand and other areas of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Kratom is also the drug that is derived from the leaves of the tree. The fresh leaves can be chewed uh, both for its stimulant and analgesic effects, uh, depending on the amounts that are being consumed. The dried leaves can be used to prepare a tree or it can be ground up into powdered preparations. What's important to note is that these leaves, if they are dried, uh, contain uh, the proposed active ingredients, metragenin and 7-hydroxymetragenin, among others. And these are indole alkaloids. We will look at the structures of these indole alkaloids in just a moment. Uh, this is uh, the pictures here are actually open source pictures um, that have been reproduced in an earlier publication that I made together with two of my graduate students in 2016. Mitragyna alkaloids are uh, found in relatively decent concentrations in the leaves. Uh, Metragenin is currently the main alkaloid that is being explored for its activity as a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptors uh, with relatively low potency compared to morphine. Uh, so it depends both on the route of administration as well as uh, the actual potency comparison uh, to the opioid. It also acts as a competitive antagonist at the kappa opioid receptor and shows uh, actually almost no binding affinity for the delta opioid receptor. And this is the structure of metragenin itself. Uh, this is the endole structure here. And then uh, you have a side chain uh, that uh, classifies it as an indole alkaloid. 7-hydroxymetragenin uh, presents with much higher potency and the only differentiating factor here is actually the presence of this hydroxy here um, that differentiates it from metragenin, uh, its, um, its parent structure. It acts as a partial agonist at mu opioid receptors in a similar manner to metragenin, but with much higher potency, meaning that much lower concentrations are needed in order to produce the same effect. But it also acts as a competitive antagonist at the kappa opioid receptor and also shows affinity at the delta opioid receptors 
uh, but here with weaker affinity uh, versus um, the kappa opioid receptors. So we see a little bit of a difference between metragenin and 7 hydroxymetragenin. Uh, there are a number of additional indole alkaloids, uh, pinanthein, speciogynin, and speciosiliatin that are present uh, among others. And as of yet, we haven't uh, as well explored these other alkaloids in uh, kratom extracts, but they are present in much lower concentrations though. Uh, so currently, uh, the research is mainly focusing on metragenin and 7-hydroxymetragenin within Kratom. How do these two compounds mainly act on opioid receptors? And this obviously goes very much into detail already uh, in regards to the pharmacology. Uh, it has been shown that metragenin acts and 7-hydroxymetragenin alike uh, act different from the classical opioids on the opioid receptors. Uh, we know that uh, morphine uh, acts on the mu opioid receptor to recruit two different pathways. One is the classical G protein coupled receptor. This is uh, this uh, membrane-bound um, three-protein-based um, um, uh, process where uh, basically as a second messenger CAMP is recruited. And then uh, that uh, then leads to specific uh, intracellular uh, signals that then lead to the analgesic effects. In addition, morphine also will recruit beta aristin, uh, and that leads to respiratory depression, constipation, and development of tolerance. Now, what has been shown in experiments in isolated uh, receptor and uh, cell uh, line experiments uh, conducted by various research groups is um, that the indole alkaloids, metragenin and 7-hydroxymetragenin, do not recruit beta aristin. They do not cause this uh, recruitment. They only cause the GPCR activation. They do not activate the beta aristin pathway. And therefore, it has been hypothesized, and it has, this has been observed at least to some degree, uh, in animal experiments um, that it is associated with much less uh, respiratory depression and also less constipation. But the, both of the indole alkaloids and potentially other ingredients in kratom as well, in the kratom extracts, act on another line of receptors other than the opioid receptors such as the alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, the adenosine uh, A2A receptors, the dopamine D2 receptors, the serotonin receptors, and this might in part explain some of the stimulant effects uh, that we observe at lower doses of kratom use. So at higher doses, the opioid effects may actually uh, prevail, uh, whereas at lower doses, uh, we might see more of the stimulant effects at the alpha adrenergic uh, or the serotonin and dopamine receptors. This has not been proven yet entirely, uh, but this might explain some of the differential pharmacological effects linked to the alkaloids found in kratom extracts. When we discuss the toxicity of kratom, um, there are some uh, some indications of toxicity. Uh, the traditional uses, like chewing of the leaves, are usually not associated with major toxicity, even with chronic use. So, uh, since kratom extracts are mainly used for oral consumption, for hard labor, um, usually then before somebody goes to conduct hard labor, um, they are used for the stimulant effects to maintain 
basically uh, the stamina to conduct uh, the hard labor throughout the day. Uh, the treatment of acute pain and diarrhea with tea preparations of the dried leaves may require a higher dose uh, usually in the evening than also for a potential sedative effect mediated through opioid receptors. Also, with traditional uses, there has been really no observation of dependence or misuse or abuse if the doses are maintained at a steady level, which is usually the case. Uh, the use of Kratom in opioid withdrawal has been first observed and uh, reported in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, mainly in Thailand and Malaysia, where heroin was really epidemically occurring. Uh, and this was mainly an issue because uh, people were trying to mitigate withdrawal symptoms from heroin use in Southeast Asia. Um, and it is still widely practiced there to use Kratom as a self-treatment uh, for uh, the withdrawal symptoms, even though it has been scheduled there. It has been uh, placed into schedule into a prohibited schedule in, in, in Thailand and in Malaysia. And even here in the US, we have seen an increasing trend of the self-medicated or self-treatment use uh, of Kratom for opioid addiction, both for illicit uh, opioid or other uh, drugs, as well as prescription opioid use. Uh, sometimes for mitigation of withdrawal symptoms, um, as well as for completely tapering off the use of opioids. So when we talk about the dose and the effect, uh, it has been shown uh, that if taken in relatively low doses, and the usual recommendation is one to three grams per dose, um, if Kratom extracts are taken within that uh, range, uh, then we will mainly see a, uh, a stimulant effect. Um, but also a potential loss of muscle coordination. So a muscle relaxant effect may also be seen. Uh, so these low doses of one to five grams here um, have definitely uh, an increased alertness, physical energy, uh, maybe also social behavior. Uh, but at, at both the lower dose as well as higher doses, you might then also see itching, nausea, loss of appetite, increased urination uh, as an adverse effects. Doses above five gram and especially above eight gram um, have been shown in the past uh, to uh, also have a stimulant effect of tachycardia, so a higher heart rate. And then the opioid-like uh, like effects uh, present specifically at higher doses uh, like constipation, which is typical uh, for opioids, dizziness, uh, hypotension, so lower blood pressure in combination with higher heart rate, dry mouth and, and sweating. Uh, so these are typical opioid-like effects um, that uh, really indicate that these compounds, metragenin and 7-hydroxymetragenin, act on opioid receptors. So uh, I, will, I will talk about this later. There have been uh, reports of fatalities associated with uh, Kratom use. Um, and as, November, uh, as of November 14th, 2017, the FDA commissioner uh, justified um, a public health um, announcement uh, that stated that there is reason for concern and classified Kratom as a public health risk uh, because of 36 fatalities associated with Kratom use. Um, so far, there has been one case of a Kratom fatality that only involved uh, the use of Kratom without any other concomitant drug that was detected uh, in the post-mortem uh, sample fluids. Uh, all others um, were polydrug intoxications. So Kratom was used with other drugs 
so therefore the causality link uh, linking uh, attributing uh, basically kratom use to the death of the person uh, could not be concluded uh, so uh, it's it's therefore not really conclusive if kratom was the causative agent um, that caused the death in in these other 35 fatalities the current uh, regulatory status of kratom as of november 2017 uh, remains unregulated uh, however the fda has uh, provided guidance uh, to classify uh, kratom products as a public health risk and has ordered basically an import uh, exclusion uh, for kratom products uh, because they are not classified as herbal supplements uh, based on uh, the uh, DSHEA, the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994, uh, because they see them as a new dietary ingredient and therefore they have to undergo safety testing. Uh, they rely on uh, both uh, the report of 36 fatalities uh, as well as uh, a statement or a publication by the CDC uh, from 2016, July 2016, uh, that showed an increase in um, poison control center reports, uh, calls to poison control centers uh, that went up uh, between 2010 to 2015 uh, from about uh, 30 calls to over uh, 250 calls, um, uh, 26 to uh, 263, uh, which obviously is a significant increase. If we look at uh, the relative uh, versus absolute increase, um, then one has to obviously, it's a tenfold increase in terms of absolute increase uh, percentage wise is obviously a, a much uh, larger increase um, so it has to be questioned how do we weigh the risk of public health versus the current use of kratom who is using kratom in the first place for what purposes is kratom being used uh, the dea initially in 2016 wanted to place a kratom and its alkaloids uh, metragenin and 7 hydroxymetragenin into schedule one uh, as an emergency action because they saw this public health threat and didn't want another opioid uh, contributing to uh, the opioid crisis uh, that has been ravaging parts of uh, the country in the united states uh, but there was a significant uh, public uh, backlash against this action. And so the DEA withdrew that intent. Uh, and uh, there was a public commenting period then that ended in December 2016. And now the FDA has made their statement. And it remains to be seen what action the DEA will be taking based on that FDA statement. Uh, once again, all of this information is current as of November 2017. Um, so based on the current pharmacology that we know about Kratom uh, and the kind of incidental knowledge that we have from poison control center calls um, and the obvious concern that the FDA the CDC have and the DEA in regards to uh, the truth that and the fact that Kratom contains compounds that act on opioid receptors. I think it is prudent uh, that we take a look at who is actually taking Kratom and for what purposes and how much Kratom is being consumed. In terms of uh, scheduling, uh, this is the current picture that we have. And this was taken from a website uh, that was kind of monitoring uh, these 
uh, st uh, this, uh, the, the current regulatory status on a state by state level. Uh, so green means uh, Kratom is legal uh, without any restrictions. Uh, yellow indicates that uh, legislation um, has been amended uh, so that it remains legal for now. Orange, there is pending, pending legislation on Kratom in these states. Uh, this map actually is um, uh, dated uh, as of July 2017, so it might be that something has changed. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to go to this website uh, to check for an update to this um, and potentially then look into their individual states if they want to make sure about uh, the legality of Kratom use in their individual states. Uh, blue states with fate legislation that remain legal, uh, so Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Michigan, uh, New Jersey, and Kentucky. Um, red, uh, where it is definitely banned, uh, and these are six states, uh, seven, six states actually as of right now. Um, then we've got purple uh, in Oregon, there is a study going on that involves Kratom, and then the red dots indicates individual cities that have banned Kratom. Uh, so uh, this is a very difficult picture uh, in the United States. We have a number of countries that have banned uh, Kratom, among them Germany and France and Australia. So um, a number of countries have already taken action to ban Kratom. Uh, how this will play out in the long run, we don't know yet. So. Uh, regarding my involvement with Kratom, uh, I mentioned uh, before that I did a, uh, a, uh, a review on Kratom uh, and its legal implications, its legal status with two graduate students. And I got kind of drawn into Kratom through this publication. And based on that, I was thinking how how is actually Kratom being used in the United States? and um, to evaluate that relatively quickly and get a response relatively quickly, I conducted an online anonymous survey among current Kratom users that were 18 and older uh, to obtain uh, the demographics, the health status, the reason for taking Kratom, uh, how much they used actually per dose, um, the beneficial effects and the detrimental effects. Obviously, uh, such uh, such surveys, anonymous surveys, have certain limitations. There is a reporting bias involved with that. Uh, and uh, that is something to be aware of when you report uh, the results of something like that, especially when it comes to reporting of uh, health status and how much is being used and for what purposes is Kratom being used. Uh, but still, uh, it has been giving us a first sense of uh, what Kratom is being used for, um, and uh, at least a, a glimpse at um, the current uh, user statistics uh, and demographics in the United States. Um, over the course of only two weeks in October 2016, 10,000 responses um, occurred, and out of these, uh, there were uh, 8,049 completers who completed the response. Uh, valid responses were those who actually uh, occurred from unique uh, ISP addresses uh, or IP addresses um, that were not repeat users, so that was prevented actually uh, from occurring. Uh, there is still some additional data that has not been reported and that is now basically ready and in the making to be reported and released pretty soon. So there might be an updated presentation soon to come um, to this one. So when we look at uh, the data, and I'll go over this relatively quickly, we see that uh, we have about half and half, a little bit more on the male side in terms of demographics by gender. Um, a majority of the respondents were aged 21 to 40, uh, and there is already a limitation of uh, the, in terms of the respondents, uh, a huge majority in terms of the ethnicity were uh, white, Caucasian, uh, and only uh, really a minority here were 
belonging to other ethnicities so that uh, the results may largely only um, apply to, to a, a majority white Caucasian population. Uh, in terms of um, uh, marital status, a majority were uh, married or partnered, um, about a third were single or never married. Employment status, we had over half that were employed for wages, 15% um, were self-employed, uh, and then the rest were kind of uh, a little bit uh, divided by homemaker, student, retired, unable to work, um, and then out of work for less than one year, out of work for one year, or more. When we look at the level of education, um, a large majority had at least some college, bachelor's degree, or an advanced degree. Uh, so if we add that up, we add uh, definitely more than uh, three quarters of our overall pop population uh, response. Um, and uh, only a fraction had a uh, high school degree or less. Uh, insurance coverage was an interesting breakdown. Um, about half of them had insurance through their employer. Uh, Self-insurance were 14% and then uh, no insurance was also 14%. Um, so this would be a kind of um, unique uh, picture for a developed country. Uh, most of the European countries would probably have a different breakdown. Uh, but uh, here in the United States, uh, this is about uh, what you would expect. Um, household income, uh, that was an interesting response as well, especially when we look later at uh, the responses for Kratom use. Uh, you see that uh, about more than half of the respondents had households, household incomes uh, of um, at least uh, 35,000 or more, uh, even 50,000 and more was still, uh, if you add that up, um, almost half of uh, the respondents. So that was an interesting uh, result. Uh, in regards to the breakdown of the income levels. So when we look at the reasons for Kratom use, uh, you uh, might find an interesting breakdown. The uh, number of people who were using Kratom for an illicit drug dependency, no matter if that was heroin or some other uh, illicit opioid use, cocaine, amphetamine, marijuana, uh, was 539 and people could respond they were using it for multiple uh, reasons but 539 overall uh, for a prescription medicine dependency uh, was almost was more than three times um, that for an illicit drug dependency 1813 and then really the majority of people were using it for medical condition leading to acute or chronic pain or for an emotional mental condition such as anxiety, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorders or like. Uh, these were really the two big ones where people were using uh, Kratom uh, primarily. And then uh, what was done, and these are tables that I will go over relatively quickly, are correlations between demographic variables and reasons for Kratom use and where we saw uh, some significances. So especially when we look at age uh, and we used uh, the youngest age group as the reference value, then we looked at odds ratios. Um, and these are the four reasons for uh, taking Kratom, illicit drug dependency, prescription medicine dependency, uh, acute or chronic pain and emotional or mental condition. Uh, you see here that uh, somebody who's 21 to 30 years old had a, a higher uh, odds ratio, a higher risk uh, compared to the 18 to 20 year olds uh, to actually take uh, Kratom uh, for an illicit drug dependency. Um, whereas everybody uh, who was older than 18 to 20 years old was more likely to take Kratom for a prescription uh, medicine dependency. And if you look at how this increased, uh, it's almost uh, 
a, a linear increase a little bit 2.46 3.6 and, and it goes a little bit down but here it's even more apparent for a medical condition leading to acute or chronic pain the older the person gets you really see that there is uh, an increase as we get older um, there are more and more issues with with pain quite the opposite was seen uh, as we get older in regards to emotional or mental conditions uh, that lead to kratom use uh, it, it really gets lower and lower basically uh, so for uh, the 21 to 40 year olds there was no significant uh, difference uh, but then as uh, we approach uh, 40 and then to our later ages, uh, we are less likely to take Kratom for that. In terms of gender, uh, females were, were less likely to take Kratom for an illicit drug dependency, uh, no difference in terms of prescription medicine dependency, more likely to take it for chronic pain and more likely to take it for an emotional uh, or mental condition. And then married, you see uh, some differences here, um, less likely to take it for illicit drug dependency or for an emotional mental disorder, more likely to take it uh, for an acute or chronic pain. Um, and then partnered, uh, more likely, um, you, you get kind of the picture that presents itself here uh, in general. Uh, sometimes it is a little bit um, wide, wider spread because of smaller sample sizes you, you, you see here widowed uh, 86 uh, in terms of the sample size so uh, then you get very wide uh, uh, confidence intervals and that obviously is less likely to result in significances um, when the variability is so high uh, sorry it's a little bit uh, small here but when we go further down uh, as you can see here, for race, we have uh, this huge, so that makes it hard to interpret this huge number of uh, Caucasian responses, so that makes it hard. Um, the best one to rely on is probably from the Hispanic population, and you see the only one uh, where we see a significantly lower use compared to the Caucasian um, uh, population is for an emotional and mental condition. Uh, uh, so that might be actually a true uh, difference, uh, whereas for all of the others, I would be very careful with the interpretation uh, because of the low number of responses that we received here. In regards to uh, employment status, uh, self-employed, uh, we got a decent number of responses here. Uh, they are less likely to take a kratom for a prescription medicine dependency um, or if they were students, they were also less likely to take it for that reason. However, if somebody uh, was out of work for one year or more or was unable to work, they were more likely to take uh, Kratom for um, uh, acute or chronic pain. Uh, somebody who was a homemaker or student was also more likely to take Kratom if they had an emotional or mental condition. If we go to insurance coverage, um, self-insurance uh, made somebody more likely, as well as Medicaid, Medicare, or no insurance, to take Kratom if they were uh, wanting to mitigate the withdrawal symptoms from illicit drug dependency. So uh, that was an interesting finding. So almost everybody else was more likely to take Kratom to mitigate withdrawal symptoms from illicit drug use. This was not the case for prescription medicine uh, if, it, if you, one was uh, insured through self-insurance, uh, but for the other three, Medicaid, Medicare, or no insurance, it was the case. Uh, once again, Medicaid, Medicare, or no insurance uh, were also more likely to use Kratom for an emotional or mental condition. Um, if this is indicative of uh, the coverage uh, that these programs provide, Medicaid, Medicare uh, is questionable if you consider the price of Kratom and obviously how it is available without a prescription versus some of the antidepressants, for example, um, that are only available with a prescription. That might be something that draws people uh, to using Kratom. 
And then uh, last but not least, education and income. Uh, there we see in general, uh, the more education somebody has, the less likely they are to use Kratom. Uh, so if somebody has a bachelor's or an advanced degree, uh, they are less likely to use Kratom uh, for uh, a prescription medicine dependency or uh, for uh, an emotional or mental condition. Uh, similarly, income, uh, if somebody uh, is using it for prescription medicine dependency and they have an income between 35 to roughly 50,000, under, just under 50,000, they're actually more likely to use Kratom uh, within that income bracket. So you can, from all of this information, from all of these tables, uh, you can kind of draw your own conclusions what kind of person is taking Kratom potentially or is most likely to take Kratom uh, when you look at all of these uh, different tables. Now, one interesting part is uh, the four conditions uh, that we just mentioned, the illicit drug dependency here shown in blue, uh, the prescription drug dependency in orange, um, the acute or chronic pain in gray, and the mental uh, emotional uh, disorder in yellow. Uh, if we pair that up by age, uh, basically you can uh, really see percentage-wise uh, where we have the distribution. Uh, so clearly we have the highest distributions uh, for the illicit drug dependency in the younger age groups. Whereas it shifts a little bit for prescription uh, to a little bit of a later middle-aged population and then it shifts even a little bit further uh, for acute or chronic pain to uh, almost an older population and then back to uh, a middle-aged population uh, for the emotional or mental disorders. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, observation in general in terms of who is using it for what indication. When we look at the number of doses per week, these were binned. Um, zero to seven basically indicates on average they're taking only one dose per day. Eight to 14 indicates approximately two doses per day. 15 to 21 then indicates approximately three doses. Uh, 22 to 28, four doses. Uh, and to 36, 29 to 36 would indicate up to five doses and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, anything above 48 obviously is, uh, is, quite, uh, is quite high. That would indicate about seven doses per day. Uh, when we go to the four different um, uses of Kratom, you see that really a majority of patients are uh, kind of in, in this area. Um, they are uh, up to 21 doses per week, uh, so about three doses per day. And then it really, you see a, a rapid decline and it doesn't matter really for which indication, uh, no matter if it's illicit drug, uh, opioid uh, prescription uh, drug dependency, acute or chronic pain or mental or emotional disorders. Uh, most of them really cut it off at about 21 doses. And then you see a rapid decline to about 10% um, that then really don't go any higher uh, with their doses per week that they need of Kratom. When we look at uh, the perceived benefits and amount per dose, uh, here we bend it again to less than one gram that is used of the powdered extract. And obviously uh, what we need to be aware of here, the powdered extracts are not standardized. So we don't know how much uh, of the metragenin and 7-hydroxymetragenin and the other indole alkaloids or potentially other active compounds are present in these uh, Kratom extracts that are available. So that is a significant concern that the FDA uh, rightly uh, voices that there is simply no quality involved in the available Kratom extracts that are entering the market. And that would be certainly something um, that potentially would help to provide better products to consumers 
if we were to institute um, a, a quality control uh, for, for products that enter the market, where ex exactly the label lists, this is how much metragenin is present in this extract per dose or per gram or something like that, so that consumers would be aware, first of all, this product actually contains metragenin or this, this kratom extract is actually a kratom extract. Uh, and second of all, they, they would know how much metragenin they get with, with every dose that they take. Uh, but this is currently not uh, the, the case. So what we have instead is basically only what users are self-reporting in, in this case situation. Uh, what you find in most stores, what is what is sold is usually and recommended is usually a three gram dose. And then most uh, users are kind of adjusting it if they are, if it's too much for them, then they reduce it. So that's why we went with kind of this binning uh, based on what users have told us uh, before we started uh, this, uh, this survey. So less than one gram, one to three gram, three to five gram, five to eight gram. And you really clearly see from the numbers here that a majority of users were really in the one to five gram and then five to eight gram and more than eight gram was uh, clearly not something that was our reference here was not uh, something that most users were preferring. So that's why you see in general the odds ratio being lower for most of them compared to the eight gram reference. Uh, so if somebody was using uh, less than uh, one gram, um, the odds ratio uh, was lower for them uh, of showing increased energy. Um, so uh, compared to the more than eight grams. So uh, this would be indicative uh, that uh, usually the one to five gram actually showed increased energy uh, and the five to eight gram then as well. Here really for decreased pain, there was no dose response relationship. So no matter if somebody took less than one gram or five to eight gram or even more than eight gram, there was no dose response relationship. So this is an interesting finding in that no matter if you take a very low dose or a high dose, you still get the decreased pain across the board. Interesting finding. Um, the same for increased focus, uh, which may not have been the main reason for taking it, uh, we had a, uh, a question built in there, uh, uh, what kind of medical conditions uh, some of the respondents were diagnosed with. Um, once again, self-reported, so take it with a grain of salt, but uh, there was little difference between all of them, uh, but most of them responded here that they showed increased focus uh, with uh, taking Kratom, and so there was little difference in, uh, in the dose. Uh, so no matter how much they took, they had a, an increased focus from taking Kratom. Less depressive mood, there we saw a dose response relationship. So with lower doses, uh, there was no improvement in depressive mood, whereas if somebody took three to five grams or higher, so three grams or higher, they had uh, less depressive mood, so their mood improved. The same was true for a less anxious mood or anxiety improvement in anxiety disorders. They had to take at least one gram or more in order to see an improvement uh, in their uh, anxious mood. Uh, reduced or stopped the use of opioid painkillers. Now, this was interesting uh, because here uh, we see that uh, there was uh, definitely uh, a, a relatively high amount that had to be taken in order to reduce or stop the use of opioid painkillers. Uh, and that had to be a relatively high amount of, um, of Kratom, uh, five to eight grams at least. Uh, reduced PTSD symptoms, um, 1,300 responded in the affirmative that they used Kratom or benefited from it in that way. But once again, absolutely 
no difference in terms of the dose response uh, curve uh, here. So no matter what dose was used. Elevated mood in general. So this was just uh, not really related to depressive disorders or uh, anxious disorders, but in general, an elevated mood, uh, not with an underlying um, mood disorder. Uh, and really uh, a large amount of people responded to that. But uh, they noticed that you needed on average uh, at least three grams in order to get there, uh, to get to that elevated mood. And others uh, were basically not really well interpreted uh, because there was no difference uh, less than one gram and then uh, that was not very well interpreted. So you see for some of them clearly a dose response relationship. You need a certain amount of Kratom in order to get to that effect. For others, absolutely not. Uh, so very interesting in terms of how to interpret it. Now doses per week. How many doses does one need to take in order to get to these benefits? And uh, one to seven was pretty much throughout uh, for the same uh, benefits, uh, kind of the threshold. So one needs to take on average two doses at least in order to get these benefits. Uh, and uh, even if uh, you have 2,600 folks uh, out of the total um, that only took on average one dose per day, um, a majority still had to take at least two doses per day in order to get there. Uh, and for elevated mood, uh, one had to take about three doses. But other than that, um, this was kind of where, uh, where folks had to take at least uh, two doses per day in order to get the benefits. When we look at adverse effects, we first ask the question, did you even experience any adverse effect uh, from Kratom use? And uh, overall, only 20.93% of Kratom users actually experienced any adverse effect. And these adverse effects were mainly related to gastrointestinal um, side effects. So uh, once again, we used eight gram, the highest dose uh, as uh, the comparator and uh, we took nausea and vomiting, the, the typical symptoms of opioids as, uh, the, com as, uh, as the classical adverse effects that were also reported in the CDC report uh, as uh, the common complaints that people were voicing with Kratom use when they were calling poison control centers. Uh, so here you see in general uh, that the odds ratios of having these adverse effects were always significantly lower uh, compared to the eight uh, gram reference dose. Uh, so one needs to take a significantly higher dose in order to even experience nausea. Same is true for vomiting. Uh, with diarrhea, it's a little bit different. Uh, and diarrhea obviously is not a classical symptom of an opioid. Uh, so that was not necessarily expected uh, to see a dose response relationship. Interestingly enough, between one to three grams, um, actually the risk of diarrhea was significantly reduced. Um, so you would expect usually uh, that diarrhea would be reduced uh, because opioids usually cause constipation. Rapid heartbeat, tachycardia, heart palpitations significantly lower. And if you look here at the number of people who actually experienced that, uh, you can tell, uh, same for diarrhea, uh, that that is uh, not very common, commonly occurring. Uh, whereas vomiting and nausea were definitely uh, more commonly uh, reported as an adverse effect. Shortness of breath, once again, uh, very, very, uh, low in terms of reporting. Constipation uh, was one that was much more commonly reported, but once again, it took a significantly higher amount to get to that adverse effect 
uh, and the odds ratio was uh, for all of the lower doses um, uh, significantly lower compared to the 8 gram dose. The same was done for uh, depending on how many doses per week were used and uh, here it was not as uh, as significant so uh, for nausea it didn't really depend on how many doses per week were taken um, except for uh, 8 to 14 that were significantly lower and then you see here uh, some that were um, outrageously high you see here 33.53 um, but that was not a significant uh, different uh, although it appears to be significantly different it was not uh, in the uh, in the in the p-value so uh, there are some some weird numbers simply because they were very low here so um, that was kind of the the uh, the end result of that additional adverse effects uh, once again, this trend is very common for all of them. Stomach upset, significantly lower. Dizziness or drowsiness uh, for all of them. Fainting, irritability or agitation, uh, high blood pressure, uh, which was also listed uh, by the CDC. Uh, also, as you can see here, the odds ratios are all very low uh, for them. And others then... Um, which uh, were not further specified. Um, you only see a dose of one to three gram significantly lower. Uh, so if we look at the doses, uh, you see a, um, a kind of for stomach upset, you really need to take a significant number of doses per week, uh, 37 to 48 or more in order to get to that stomach upset. So, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, here's one of these uh, fainting only 11 reported. Uh, so that's why you see outrageously high 95% um, confidence intervals in some of these cases here. So when we look at withdrawal symptoms, and this was one thing that is obviously of concern, uh, Kratom, since it contains substances that act on opioid receptors, you are concerned with withdrawal symptoms. Uh, there were a number of reports of Kratom users who reported adverse effects, and that was a total of 1,652. And they were then also asked about occurrence of withdrawal symptoms and the severity of these withdrawal symptoms. And the negative effects of Kratom was not consumed within a certain time period, uh, if it was not taken uh, for more than 12 hours, that was 240 people. If it was not taken for more than 24 hours, 304. And if it was not taken for more than 48 hours, 159. And about 949 never actually had uh, any negative effects if Kratom was not consumed um, at some point, if somebody just basically stopped taking it. Um, so that was about half of more than half of the, the population of those who stopped taking Kratom. The severity of uh, negative effects of Kratom was not consumed. Uh, so here actually it was a smiley face category. So that was that's why one is very severe and then five is not severe at all. Uh, and uh, the majority really was in the range here of two to three, um, which is uh, about uh, 70, 76%. Um, so there is, there is concern that there is uh, withdrawal symptoms associated with Kratom use. Uh, as we see here, that is roughly 43% uh, of people who uh, are experiencing negative effects and uh, roughly 76 of those actually then experience them uh, in a significant manner, in a severe manner. Now, of all of these people, uh, of everybody who is taking Kratom, um, we ask if they ever needed to be hospitalized or medical or mental health care treatment because of their Kratom consumption. 
and 21 mentioned that they needed mental health issues uh, related uh, to uh, that they experienced mental health issues related to Kratom and that they uh, or that they needed medical or physical health issues related to Kratom. Uh, so that is um, and the rest reported uh, no 7842. Uh, so the overall incidence uh, is 0.65% uh, and 99.35% reported uh, that they did not need healthcare treatment uh, for uh, uh, Kratom consumption related to their Kratom consumption. Uh, this is out of uh, a sample of 8,049. Uh, realized that uh, this is compared obviously to larger studies once again uh, a small sample it's self-reported uh, it is uh, probably a biased sample too because it was conducted in uh, current Kratom users that are probably leaning towards being uh, friendly and wanting uh, Kratom to be remain available legally available on on the market uh, but I still think that um, it is a fairly representative sample uh, considering that uh, we get data that shows adverse effect reporting uh, in, uh, in this sample uh, that is uh, representative of many of the adverse effects that one would expect to see in opioids as well. So to draw a few conclusions, uh, Kratom contains the indole alkaloids Metragenin and 7-hydroxy uh, and those act as partial agonists at the mu opioid receptors without recruiting actually the beta aristin pathway. And therefore, they have been shown to cause less respiratory depression and constipation and potentially also have a lower tendency uh, to cause uh, dependency or addiction. So, therefore, just alone looking at metragenin and 7 hydroxymetragenin would be worth uh, in the development of novel central opioid analgesics. Uh, obviously, they have to somehow get to the central nervous system. Um, we don't necessarily know all that much about their bioavailability. It looks like uh, in some studies, animal experiments, they have shown some degree of bioavailability in the range of 30 to 40 percent. Uh, there might be some influence with uh, subenzyme first pass metabolism in the liver that needs to be addressed. Uh, but uh, metragenin 7 hydroxymetragenin may show a promise at least uh, as new drug lead structures in the development of, uh, of opioid analgesics with less adverse effects. Uh, Kratom use in the US is uh, for diverse reasons and if uh, we can rely on what the American Kratom Association says and that is obviously a conservative estimate based on their membership numbers uh, we might have as many as four to five million uh, current Kratom users that's based on their membership numbers it might be less than that um, most likely is less than that uh, but that is a significant number of users that we need to consider in whatever uh, our legislative steps will be in the future. Uh, because whatever we legislate about will affect uh, those users. So something to keep in mind. The majority use it for the analgesic effects for acute or chronic pain and for mood disorders. Um, there is a potential dose-benefit effect relationship um, that I have illustrated uh, for increased energy, for reduction in opioid use, although that tends to be at higher uh, doses and concentrations, and also for mood disorders. Uh, although there has not been a relationship between dose uh, and effect for decreased pain and increased focus. So that is an interesting finding in regards to uh, both the metragenin dose and the effects of metragenin uh, on the opioid receptors. There might be, and, and clearly we have seen that in, in the survey, a potential dose adverse effect relationship for the gastrointestinal and CNS effects. Most 
uh, presented with lower odds ratios for doses uh, below 5 gram and sometimes even below 8 grams. So somebody needs to take significantly higher amounts of Kratom uh, based on uh, the results of this survey in order to actually get uh, to uh, experience these uh, adverse effects. The younger age group tends to take Kratom for illicit drug withdrawal, uh, but there is really no difference in the doses per week for reasons for Kratom uh, consumption. Most of them really uh, kind of cut it off around uh, 21 doses per week or on average three doses per day. Uh, so I think that's an indication that uh, Kratom is usually not likely to be increased in doses per day over time um, and likely not as likely to be abused for its opioid-like effects based on this study at least. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I'm sure there are quite a few questions based on the current public discussion about Kratom. Um, this recording uh, is posted on YouTube, so it, it might be publicly circulated, uh, but it is primarily targeted towards my students at the University of Florida in the online uh, graduate uh, programs uh, in pharmaceutical chemistry and clinical toxicology. Once again, uh, this is uh, currently the knowledge that is available as of November 2017. I might record uh, this lecture again or this presentation again as new information becomes available. Uh, my email address is uh, found here, Grundman with one N at the end at ufl.edu. I look forward to ongoing discussions with my students and uh, with whoever is interested in reaching out to me. Thank you very much for your attention and for listening to me and um, have a wonderful day.